That was awesome. Wow. Mm. Take a minute and catch our breath. If you brought your Bible with you, you can open up to Luke chapter 4. Verse 16, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Jody. I'm the children's ministry pastor. To those of you that are at home online, um, wherever you are in the world, thanks for tuning in. It's good to see you. Glad you're here. And I hope that this blesses you as much as it did me. Uh, I'm, guys, I'm kind of preaching to myself tonight. I hope that's okay with y'all. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just gonna kind of, uh, I've been teaching myself for a few days now and uh, I'm starting to get some things. I've got that other one there. Um, how many of you like gifts? Any of you like a gift? Um, Kim is really good at gifts. She likes gifts. She likes to give gifts. And she always knows the exact gift that the person needs. Um, me, on the other hand, not so much. Which makes for an interesting 30 years of marriage when she loves gifts and I am just now figuring that out. Tonight, God wants to give you a gift. And he also wants to eliminate some things that may be blocking you from receiving those gifts. Because when you, you know... God, when he gives you a gift, he just places it there. It's up to you to receive it. But he gives you that gift. So in Luke chapter four, starting in verse 16, Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. It was, easy, was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and sat down. You know, that was an awkward silence. Everyone in the synagogue was staring at him. And he said, oh, today that scripture was fulfilled and you're hearing it. And then silence. And he heard their thoughts. They bore witness and, and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. <laughs> That sounds like a, like a biblical way of saying they said, what? They said, is this not Joseph's son? He knew what they were thinking. And he said to them, surely you're going to say, physician, heal yourself. What you've done in Capernaum, do here. See, he was tell they were thinking, well, if you're really a prophet, you'll do a miracle here like you did there, then maybe we'll believe you. But he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Then he gave a couple of examples from the Old Testament of Elijah uh, that went to the widow in Sidon and Elisha, the prophet. He said, surely there were many lepers in Israel, but Elisha went to Naaman in Syria and healed him of leprosy. Basically, what he was saying is, if Israel won't believe in me, I'll send someone to the Gentiles, but I'm the real deal. He basically called them out for their arrogance and their pride and their religious spirit that had made them think they are better than everybody else. He called them out and they got so mad, they took him to the edge of a cliff to throw him off the cliff. And then I love what the Bible says, it says, then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Like, 
Did they see him passing through the middle of them? Did he just, did they make way? How did that work? They're trying to throw him off a cliff, but he passed through the middle of them. Mark chapter six continues this story. It says, now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Catch that. He marveled at their unbelief. They didn't believe in him at all. This is, this is the carpenter's kid, Joseph. We know him ever since he was a little boy. We've known this guy. That, that Jesus can't be the promised Messiah. Because of their unbelief, it says he could do no mighty work there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. That seems like kind of a mighty work to me. But he was able to do that in an area where nobody believed. He laid hands on the sick and they were healed. So as we've heard before, it was and still is Jesus' will that all be healed. Not some, but all. Ask the centurion, ask Peter's mother-in-law, ask Lazarus, ask the blind man, Bartimaeus, ask him. Ask uh, the lepers, ask the man at the pool of Bethesda, ask the man who was lowered through the roof by his friends. Uh, what about the man with the shriveled hand? I bet you could ask him and he'd tell you, yeah, he wanted me healed. All of them were healed and restored. Their sins were forgiven and they were healed, made whole and set free. Remember his mission statement, we just read it. To set free the captives, those that are bound up, those that are blind spiritually and physically, those that are broken hearted. I mean, you gotta remember this group of people was under Roman oppression there was a lot of brokenheartedness in Israel at that time. It was a gift to anyone who would receive it. Now, Jesus has another gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He promised that gift before his ascension. Um, he said he would send a helper. It's kind of a nice way of putting it, right? I'll send a helper when I leave. John 14, 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. And the Father will be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Greater things than these how many of y'all raised people from the dead yet? Jesus did it on more than one occasion. So what are we missing? He promised, and he's not a liar. What are we missing? If you haven't read the 14th chapter of John in a while, I recommend you go meditate on that one. The entire 14th chapter should fill us with so much joy and hope and expectancy of the goodness of God. See, he promised not to leave us as orphans, not to abandon us, but to send a helper. John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said. Now, how do we get that brought to our remembrance? First, we have to have heard it. And it's in here. We have to have heard it and he'll bring it to our remembrance. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He helps us, and he points us directly to Jesus and what he said. He also points us to the truth. You ever heard something that didn't quite sound right? And you couldn't figure out, ah, it doesn't sound right. If you recognize that doesn't quite sound right, and it wasn't, it's because the Holy Spirit is telling you, uh, check that. I tell you the truth, this is John 16, 7. 
It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Before it said, my father will send him. Now he's saying, I will send him. They're one and the same. He said, I only do what I see my father do and say what I hear my father say. That's how close their bond was. That's how tight the father and son were. That's what's available for us. That's the expectancy that as we grow in our faith and maturity and walking with the Holy Spirit, we become so surrendered to the Holy Spirit that we only hear what we say, hear the Father say and we only say, say what we, we only do what we see the Father do. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not there yet. He promised the gift to not only the disciples, but to us on the day of Pentecost. Acts 1, 5 and Uh, five through eight, Jesus said, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall receive, shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, which the father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, in Raleigh, North Carolina, the United States, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 2, 38 through 39 says, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift, there's that word again, the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord will call. Note that promise is not just for them, but for you, and not for you, but to your children. Kids, I've got news for you. There is no junior Holy Spirit you get the same Holy Spirit mom and dad get. You don't get a miniature shrunk down, watered down version. And the thing about it is y'all don't have 30, 40, 50, 60 years of stuff to unlearn. So when you pick up a Bible like this, if it's in red, Jesus said it, that means you can do it. End of story. Sorry, I got off on a little tangent there. Sometimes these gifts go hand in hand. The gift of healing or the gift of healings where the Holy Spirit anoints someone to lay hands on the sick and they recover. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, which allows that to happen and points to the glory of Jesus. And the witnesses around that see this happen are awestruck and want to know more about this Jesus that you follow and are drawn to relationship with God through the miraculous. Luke 11, 11 through 13 in the Amplified. I heard someone once say the Amplified is the woman's version of the Bible. It says more words than are necessary. Getting in deep water now, aren't we? (laughs) Went to meddling. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, that is sinful by nature, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and continue to ask? See, it's a continual process, a continual filling of the Holy Spirit. Romans 2, verse 4 says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, which is basically a a refrain from enforcing something, and long-suffering, which is patience, uh, a 
boldness in resisting a rash reaction. Not knowing the goodness of God leads you to repentance. See, it's his goodness towards us that causes us to turn and say, wait a minute, that's not what I expected. That's not what I deserved. And we focus and put our face on Jesus. See, the challenge many of us may have experienced is the goodness of God as father because we're struggling with the concept there of God being a good father because our earthly fathers maybe weren't the best example of that. Um, Moses struggled with this. Moses was raised in the palace as the grandson of Pharaoh with all its benefits and privileges. And when he saw the Egyptian whipping a Hebrew slave, he killed him and then ran for his life for fear of his grandfather. They find out what I've done, they'll kill me. And he ran for 40 years. So when God finds him in the desert, Moses gives every excuse in the book. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't speak too, too good. Moses had been trained to be an orator by Pharaoh. Well, you need to send somebody else. Every excuse he could think of. And God said, no, listen, I'm sending you. He couldn't see God as he was because he saw him through blinders of Pharaoh, through the lens of his earthly father, through the lens of abandonment, distrust, a harsh rebuke. At what point is God gonna get tired of hearing about my problems? How many times do I make the same mistake before he just smites me? I'm on my own to figure this out. Church, that is not the heart of God. His heart is to bring us closer into relationship with himself, to heal our brokenness, to heal our wounds, to restore us, to build us up, to lead us and guide us so that we may be a light to the world and direct them to him. God is love. He's goodness and mercy. First Chronicles 16 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Psalm 34, eight says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Taste and see. That's a Dr. Seuss book. Green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. Try them. Well, he eats it and he loves green eggs and ham. Taste and see. Psalm 33, five, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Have you seen the Rocky Mountains? Have you seen the clear blue waters of tropical beaches? Look up. When you, tonight, it's supposed to be a clear night. Look up. The Bible says the heavens declare his glory. Amen. Now, you wanna see the glory of God, go to a, a tropical beach and look up at night or go to the top of the Rockies and look up at night when there's nothing hindering your view. God is good. When we can grasp that, it'll change the way we approach him. See, an injured horse has great difficulty carrying its rider. The weight causes it to not be able to perform what it was designed to do. Once the horse is healed, it can continue the work it was created for. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We were created to carry the glory of God within us, the Holy Spirit to a dark and dying world. That's what we are created to do. But when we're wounded and weakened, we're not able to fulfill the plan that God has for us. Church, God wants us to roar with the power that he has prepared for us. To reach a lost and dying world with his love, his mercy, and his grace. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. So many times we hear people say, man, if I could just see others the way God sees them. You ever heard that? You may have said that. 
No condemnation. What if we're asking the wrong question? What if instead of saying, God, let me see them as you see them, we started asking, God, let me see you as you really are. And we spend time in that, seeing him as he really is and allow that to permeate everything in us so that from that place of his goodness, we see what he sees. We see Wanda as she really is in God's eyes. Sorry, Wanda. (laughs) We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. When we are wholehearted, walking in the power and leading of the Holy Spirit, our life becomes a testimony, a light that those walking in darkness are drawn to. See, God wants us whole. Maybe I hadn't said that yet. God wants us whole, healed, restored, and adjusted to be able to accomplish all he has planned for us. That's why he gave us this gift of the Holy Spirit. We need to get our vision correct. Stop looking through our Pharaoh blinders. Romans 8, 28 tells us that we know he works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. If it's not good yet, he's not done. Romans 8 also tells us that we are sons of God, joint heirs with Christ through the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will strengthen our mortal bodies. will heal us that we may heal others. Restore us that we can lead others to the restoration that only comes from the Father. Ignite the passions in us that God created us to walk in and lead us to a freedom that we've never known. Free from sin, from shame, even death itself. That we may discover our identity and purpose. 1 Peter 2.24 says, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. What are we afraid of? Taste and see. Jesus asked the man at the pool of Bethesda, what do you want? Uh, healing. What he's asking is, what do you really want? Because when you're healed, the hindrance that became an excuse is gone. So what do you really want? Your identity changes. Blind Bartimaeus was known as Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bart got healed, became the artist formerly known as Blind Bart. (laughs) Are you willing to change your identity to match who God made you to be? What do you really want? There's nothing to fear. Step up and receive the gifts God has for you. 1 John 4, 18 says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. When we see his love, we're drawn by the Holy Spirit closer to relationship with him. See, the enemy has tried to instill a culture of fear in the world, of confusion, of division, of anger, of deceit. Over the last few years, for sure, over the last decades, I think. But we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Speaking of sound mind, Psalm 107 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and of the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. 
weariness of mind and soul. They're tired of it all. I'm overwhelmed. Got anxiety, trauma, depression, whatever you want to call it. Weariness of mind and soul. It's a hunger, a thirst for something better, even if you are not sure what that something is. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distress. He led them forth in the right way that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. And then it gets to verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. He sent his word, the word became flesh. Jesus, who then sent us the Holy Spirit and healed them and delivered them. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Psalm 103 Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction, crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, and satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. This list sounds very similar to another list that we talked about where you're healed and have liberty and recovery and freedom. Oh, wait. Heal the brokenhearted, check. Proclaim liberty to the captives, check. Recovery of sight to the blind, check. Set at liberty those who are oppressed. Yeah, sounds pretty close. See, he wants us so that our youth is renewed like the eagles so that we can soar above the circumstances no matter what's going on in the world. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you are not like that for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And Hosea 3, 5 says, in the last days, they will tremble in awe of the Lord and of his goodness. How many of y'all believe we might be in the last days? If the worship team would come back up, if you have an area of your life that needs healing, it may be physical, mental, emotional, relational, just raise your hands. Close your eyes, raise your hands and start thanking God for his goodness right where you're at. Start thanking him for his goodness, for his mercy. He's a good God. He is love. Uh, If any of the, the staff pastors and elders that are um, feel led would come to the front because I feel that we need to pray for an impartation of the revelation of God's goodness. Because if we can grasp that and taste and see, if we can grasp that goodness of God that's beyond understanding, His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. He thinks stuff we never even imagined we could think of. And in his goodness, he wants that for us. There needs to be an impartation of the revelation of God's goodness. Maybe you need his healing touch. This group of people before you are anointed by God to lay hands on the sick and 
to see them recover, whether it's physical, mental, emotional. Guys, we've been through some trauma over the last few years. And I'm concerned we hadn't even started cashing the check on that bill. We've been trying to bury it, to hide it, to numb it, to home improvement our way out of it. But something's missing. And we need that freshness from God, that fresh touch. We need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. We need him to just saturate us in his love and in his power. So as we continue to worship, let the goodness of God overwhelm you. Let it drive out fear and depression and anxiety and fill you with love, hope, peace, strength, boldness. Holy Spirit, come and have your way in us. If you've got an area in your life that needs healing, if everyone would stand, because we're gonna continue worshiping. If you've got an area of your life that needs a touch from God, from his power, the touch of the Holy Spirit, I encourage you to come forward and let this group of folks pray for you, pray with you, to stand with you. Dads, we've got a big task. We've got to represent and model the love of a heavenly father. And it's not too late. My kids are grown, but it's not too late. There's a generation of kids with no fathers. that They need to see what a godly, loving, heavenly father looks like that's not abusive, that is there for them, that will never leave them or forsake them. Men, we can do that, even if it's not your kids. Because there are kids that have no fathers. Father is checked out. Holy Spirit, come fill this place with your presence, with your power. We open our hearts and our lives and our minds to you right now. Holy Spirit, inundate us with your power and your love. There are backs that need a touch. There are knees that need healing. There's a deep wound in the heart, a deep wound in the heart that has never been addressed and has never healed, that the Holy Spirit is nudging you, saying, I'm here, and I'm a good God. Let me touch that place and heal it. Let me heal the loss that you've endured. Let me heal the trauma Let me heal the PTSD, the anxiety. Let me touch that area of your life, of your heart, of your mind to bring wholeness and restoration and strengthening. Let me touch that. If that's you and the Holy Spirit is prompting you, you can come forward. We'd love to pray with you.